Now coming to the stage virtually, please welcome Graham Hubler. Good morning. In this talk, I demonstrate how one assumption coupled to several recent experimental results can lead to useful microscopic insights that unify disparate anomalous heat effect experiments under one umbrella. Simply posited, the anomalous heat effect requires a specific frequency optical phonon resonance that couples to electromagnetic radiation of the same frequency. If it can be arranged to sustain this specific resonance, then the AHE is produced. The anomalous heat effect is fundamentally a solid state and physics problem, not a nuclear physics problem. It occurs in the solid state. There are unknown excitations occurring in the solid state that produce the heat. A survey of several hundred named solid state phenomena provide no clues, and so we need measurements that reveal phenomena at the scale of the atom in relevant material systems. This is a bottom-up approach where we search for the unknown excitations and then try to map them onto a nuclear process. In the following, I describe three important microscopic measurements to provide clues to an improved understanding of the AHE. First experiment is perturbed angular correlations, and this slide demonstrates how this experiment works. In the upper panel, a nucleus with a quadrupole moment cube will process with an angular frequency omega cube in an electric field gradient. According to this equation, where it's proportional to the quadrupole moment times the electric field gradient, if we measure omega and Q is known, then we can determine the electric field gradient at the nucleus. Quadrupole moment simply means that the nucleus is egg-shaped, not spherical shape. So we ion-implanted radioactive hafnium-181 onto a substitutional lattice site of palladium. The nucleus hafnium decays to tantalum-181 with a half-life of 42 days. The hafnium beta decays through a gamma cascade, gamma-1, gamma-2. The intermediate state, 5 half state, has a lifetime of 11 nanoseconds and it has a quadrupole moment. So if we place the sample and surround it with gamma detectors and we measure gamma-1, the timing difference between gamma-1 and gamma-2 with one nanosecond time resolution, we can determine omega Q. In the lower panel, the electric field around the nucleus is uniform in FCC palladium, so there's no electric field gradient and the omega is zero. However, when you add hydrogen or deuterium, it distorts the palladium lattice, so an electric field around the nucleus is non-uniform, which produces the electric field gradient, and we can then get a precession. Here we show the electrochemical cell surrounded by gamma detectors at CERN, and the plot shows the results where the Precession frequency in megarads per second is plotted versus the concentration of H or D. Now H is the green squares, and we see it's zero initially, and then it jumps up to about 15 megarads per second over the whole range of concentration. However, the deuterium uh, is the circles, and it shows it is greater than the H and uh, at about 50% greater. So the microscopic physics is that the strain around the tunnel is 50% higher in D-loaded samples than H-loaded samples. This is a very unexpected result. The second experiment is superconductivity in the palladium hydrides. It was known for 50 years that palladium deut deuteride is superconducting with a TC of 11K and palladium uh, hydride 9K. Recent experiments uh, the, the, you soak palladium wires on 100 bar of D2 at 300 degrees C, you rapidly cool it to 40 K, and then heat it to room temperature. The results I show the eight samples show transition temperatures of about 60 K uh, for deuterium and 50 for hydrogen. The microscopic physics here is that the X ray data in this showed substantial tetrahedral site occupancy. And the tetrahedral site is one-third the volume of the octahedral site, so the lattice expands, and the lattice expansion causes an electronic band structure change, increasing TC. 
And in this paper, the, the maximum absolute tetrahedral occupancy was found at a deuterium to metal atomic ratio of 0.6, where about one third of all D atoms were in tetrahedral sites. The third experiment is internal friction in palladium hydride. The experiment is you'd electrochemically load a palladium bar to different hydrogen concentrations, you resonate the bar, and flexure at 3 kilohertz, and measure the damping at a temperature of 114 K, and you plot the damping, 1 over Q, as a function of hydrogen concentration. Now, the microscopic physics here is that there's a loss, there's a mechanical coupling loss peak to hydrogen diffusion. It gives you the magnitude of the diffusion and a mechanical coupling to dislocation motion. Now the data shows the red curve is increasing uh, concentration of hydrogen, shows it maximizes at about 0.64 and very rapidly drops off uh, above 0.64. So the, this is where the diffusion is maximum. This is on the way back down. Then the dislocation motion shows that the dislocations are active until you get about 0.55 and you go through the alpha beta phase transition, when you come back down, you doubled the number of dislocations, which is uh, well known that you damage the material. Uh, and so you also see that the dislocations are locked above 0.5. So if we go back now to the X-ray diffraction data from the previous slide, what they say, the maximum T site occupancy occurs where the flux of diffusing atoms is a maximum. All of them would pass through the T sites. At high concentrations, the octahedral sites are nearly filled, blocking the diffusion pathways. In the middle range, therefore, the diffusive flux and potential for T site occupancy is greatest at 0.64. So the implication of these three papers is as follows. In the PAC experiment, hafnium was ion implanted at 80 kilovolt energy. So all half nanometer atoms are within less than 20 nanometers of the surface where the D diffusion in and out of the surface and electron current dynamics are maximized. So the electromigration could provide the energy necessary to elevate substantial D into the tetrahedral site so that the material synthesized by the quench of palladium deuteride from 300 C and the palladium deuteride in the surface created by the PAC experiment are one and the same material. Therefore, the 50% greater strain seen in the perturbed angular correlation experiment is caused by substantial T site occupation. So how could these facts apply to the AHE? Well, we modify the hypothesis. The AHE requires a specific frequency optical phonon resonance that is only attainable when there is significant deoccupation of the tetrahedral sites. So what is this specific phonon frequency, and how do you get it? Specific phonon frequency is a complicated function of the intercellular site occupancy, the deconcentration, and vacancy defect concentration, and temperature. So here we have the measured phonon dispersion for palladium D uh, 0.63 in the block at the left. The upper curves are for the hydrogen sublattice and the lower curves are for the palladium sublattice. And if we take the 100k space uh, direction and convert, take, take that over to the centered plot, we see those frequencies there for deuterium. And then we have a number of different configurations of palladium hydrides. Now the black squares are palladium hydride with hydrogen in the octahedral position, stoichiometric palladium hydride. The circles are for palladium hydride with all the hydrogen in the tetrahedral position. And you see it's a big bump in, in hydrogen sublattice. The blue triangles are for 25% vacancies in palladium with hydrogen in the octahedral position, and the red triangles are for 25% vacancy in palladium with hydrogen in the tetrahedral position. So you see the special frequency is possibly reached either by T site occupancy or vacancy concentration uh, and over some variety. So the special phonon frequency could be from 2 to 40 terahertz according to this. Raman data by Mitchell Schwartz suggests perhaps 4.3 terahertz which would place it in the palladium sublattice. 
Note that if the special frequency lies in a gap of possible frequencies for palladium hydride, there is no AAG for hydrogen. If you look at the, the red squares for, for hydrogen uh, and the black squares for, or for deuterium and the black squares for hydrogen, you see that if the red squares are the right frequency, you can never reach them with the hydrogen, so you only get the effect with deuterium. So to make heat in palladium, three things need to be true. You need significant population of D in a tetrahedral site or high vacancy concentration. Either A or B provides a special phonon frequency that produces the anomalous heat effect. Two, you need to simulate this resonance by a trigger. And three, you need to sustain the stimulus to keep the resonant active. It's very helpful to have a 1-0-0 texture material as demonstrated by research by Vittorio Violante. Now, the AHE is irreproducible because condition one is difficult to obtain. Researchers arrived at this condition by chance. Nanostructures themselves can resonate at the special frequency and produce small amounts of heat since there is not much volume of material. And in fact, nine nanometer diameter palladium nanoparticles have 30% T site occupation. Uh, and, and these are, are useful for getting the heat. So the materials, methods, and triggers for palladium are the palladium rods, wires, foils, and nanoparticles. The methods are electrochemical loading, gas loading under D2 pressure, ultrasound, and blow discharge are the main ones. Various triggers, current variations, laser impingement, electric pulse, temperature, acoustic shock, nanoparticles on the surface, and surface nano features can be very useful. Frequently, nano feature deposits are found on cathodes after heat events. Vittorio Violante has detailed how such features can support high frequency resonances driven by charge exchange. And historically, it is possible that months delay before the AHE appeared in the Fleisch and Pons experiments that such deposits developed over time and provided a trigger and high frequency high vacancy concentrations developed over time that provided the special frequency phonon. Because it's known that uh, over long periods of time, electro, uh, electrochemical loading inserts vacancies into the palladium. So what about nickel? Well, the materials are nanoparticles, nanoparticle coated wires, Nanoparticles contained in the zirconia powders, nickel powders, nickel coated meshes, they all use nickel based nanoparticle formulations in their reactors. And of course, nickel nano thickness films. The trigger is simply temperature, according to all these authors listed here. For nickel, nanostructures are preferred over bulk materials. Since temperature thermally drives the phonons, there's no need for a trigger. And since H produces heat, the nickel hydrogen nanostructures produced a special phonon frequency. The AHE with nickel is more reproducible than palladium. There's no need to kick D into tetrahedral sites or produce high, a high vacancy concentration. And the trigger is simply thermal. In summary, for palladium, both bulk and nanoparticles will give you heat, whereas in nickel, it's hydrogen and nanoparticles where bulk does not give you heat. And factors to, to get the heat, so for, for palladium, of course, you need deuterium, tetrahedral site occupancy, and probably vacancy defects, polycrystal and texture help. And there's four different ways at least to trigger it. For nickel, it's just simply hydrogen concentration uh, in uh, polycrystal and texture, I think is probably useful in just elevated temperature. The specific resonance phonon model is agnostic as to what the actual AHE mechanism is. So in this model, the anomalous heat effect causes atomic motion in the form of coherent phonons or causes RF emission in the solid at the same frequency as the phonons. The specific frequency RF is absorbed and emitted by charged palladium or hydrogen atoms, which is a mechanism to sustain the phonon resonance once started. Any particular theory of the actual energy source will be mapped onto this special frequency phonon model. Q 
keeping in mind that only the only signatures of the AHE are heat production, RF emission, and no nuclear emissions. Now my 15 minutes are up, so I'm going to leave this slide up as uh, I ta we take questions. So thank you for listening. Thank you.